Okay, so today we're going through a chapter from B.F. Skinner's book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, written in 1971, and the chapter is called Freedom. I'm only going to talk about this one chapter for now because a lot of the stuff in the book I don't really agree with completely, but this chapter I think is very relevant for today, uh, for today's times, because I think we do need a reconceptualization of freedom. So, but before I launch into my own spiel, uh, let me just present some key points Skinner makes in this chapter. Um, so he kind of traces the human struggle for freedom back to what even simpler organisms do, which is they try and get away from aversive stimuli. Aversive as in, these are stimuli that we want to get away from, okay? They're bad for us, all right? And we can see this in even the most um, base like instincts, like a reflex, you get away from something. In, in humans, it would be like, let's say there's a hot stove, you try and pull your hand away, okay? You're trying to get free of that thing that's aversive to you, okay? And... In human society today, we've mostly gotten rid of things that are aversive to, to us in this way. Technology has enabled us to do this. So, for example, we have we can practice temperature control, right? We've gotten away from the extremes of cold, let's say. Uh, we've gotten away from sources of danger, mostly. So, in this sense, we've succeeded, right? But the thing is that there's a whole other level of the struggle for freedom when it comes to uh, the social environment. Because uh, other people can arrange aversive stimuli for us. Uh, so let's say slavery, oppression, uh, let's say religion oppressing us by making us think that they can offer us uh, heaven if you just pay them enough, stuff like this, right? And this Skinner then brings about the concept of freedom literature, which is literature that basically identifies these people that are aversively controlling us. It gives us modes of action to uh, fight against them or run away from them. For example, we can boycott, we can ostracize, um, we can assassinate them, stuff like this, right? It does this through stuff like manifestos, pamphlets, today might be podcasts. And it kind of also illustrates that those those conditions are bad for you, they're aversive to you. So they might contrast them with um, other freer conditions. Um, and actually here, I'll just connect something. So I remember in Robert Cialdini's, Cialdini's book, he, brought, he was talking about psychological reactants. This is kind of the human proclivity to preserve freedom that you already have. You don't want to lose it. We're very averse to giving up freedom that we already have. And he quotes somebody, some other author who did a study on uh, kind of historical struggles for freedom. And they tend to come after a population has tasted freedom in the first place. And I think in Russia, it was Gorbachev's time where they tasted I guess capitalist freedom or something, and then after that they didn't want to give it back up when you try oppressing them again. And he, in the study, also mentioned uh, American slavery, where after they tasted better times, like better employment rates and stuff, now they they want more. They don't want to go back into subjugation, right? I don't remember all the studies he mentions or the details, but just this idea, right? Once you taste freedom, you you don't want to give it up. You'll fight for it, and this is what freedom literature's role kind of is. It, it gives you that taste of freedom. It lets you know there's something better out there. So we need that freedom freedom of literature. It's very important, okay? Uh, moving on from there, Skinner talks about how this freedom of literature, as useful as it has been, it has accomplished wonderful things, it is always focused on the state of mind or the feelings associated with freedom. So you take really notable authors like Leibniz or Voltaire, he quotes in this chapter, they say stuff like, Liberty is basically being able to do what I want to do, okay? And, and here you run into a problem because in today's times, most of these controls, or at least in Western society, most of these controls placed on you are what we would call positive reinforcement, okay? They don't generate immediate counterattack or escape or something because it's not even obvious to you that there is uh, a controlling attempt placed on you. Okay, so uh, in this chapter, he quotes... Um, I guess, two French writers of this day or something where they talk about how you can tame people in the same way that you tame lions by masturbation, okay? And and I think this is still relevant today. Like, give people enough gambling, give them enough sex, and they think they're free. They feel good, so it's like, fuck it. You can, you can control them as much as you want, right? So we need to be extra aware of these positive reinforcements, which are also aversive to you, but you don't realize, okay? And they hear kind of freedom literature faces a challenge because... When the, these aversive consequences are so delayed in time, so deferred, you don't even realize that they're bad for you. Uh, freedom literature kind of has to bring them to bear on the present. It has to show you that what you're doing, despite how good it feels, 
is going to lead to that sh shitty outcome for you in the future. Okay, it has to bring those d deferred aversive consequences to bear on the present. Okay, but yeah, so that means we need to kind of redefine freedom, reconceptualize it, and be extra aware of these positive reinforcements that can also control you, right? So yes, uh, Skinner argues that we need to stop focusing on the feeling of freedom so much and focus on what freedom really is, as it traces back to even more primitive organisms, what they do for freedom. It's basically getting rid of stuff that's aversive to you, okay? And this is where freedom literature comes in to show you what is really aversive to you, okay? Now, I'm just going to riff on this because I think this is very relevant today. So we think in today's society that all forms of control are bad, okay? And of course, then you have the whole other side, like the uh, the the leftists, who want to have a shitload of control. And I think we need nuances. Okay, both sides are correct. Obviously, there's a very real danger of government going overboard and having too much control over us, especially during these COVID times. We, we're scared. There's like a world government being imposed on us, and we're just slowly moving towards this end. Right. On the other hand, like Skinner points out, if you're so uh, worried about just the feeling of being free and if the freedom the, the feeling of freedom is what you value then all forms of control are just immediately bad for you then you miss out on very important uh, necessary means of uh, so, I'm not even going to call it social control where, because often when you use a word you've kind of put the cart before the horse and you just lost the argument already so I remember G George Lakoff talking about this in uh, one of his books where he talks about the abortion debate, where once you have once you call a position pro-life, you've already won the debate, okay? Because what? The other position is going to argue against life. So I think it's very important to choose the right words, the right concepts, to evoke the right metaphors, the right frames of mind, right? So I'm not... Let's just say we miss the benefits of a social environment when we try to get rid of all controls completely. We just immediately think control is bad, Okay. And I think this is a misunderstanding of freedom. I've read in a couple of places now where he talks, where they talk about how even, let's say, the arm to move, you need certain um, structure there. You need certain control there. Then it makes you more free to do the things, right? Imagine if you didn't have these joints uh, keeping your arm in place, right? So that's, that's kind of a redefinition of freedom. You need that structure there so you can even be even more free to do the things you want. Albert Bandura in his book, Moral and Disengagement, uses the example of cars on highway, you need the rules there so you can get to your destination. And without those rules, you just have chaos and you're actually less free than before. Another example I read somewhere was uh, a, a wheel spinning around a hub, I guess, or an axle. You need that axle there. You need the wheel to be attached to it so you can spin freely, right? So these are metaphors I want you to call to mind so that you don't just think immediately that all controls are bad. We kind of need those, right? And this kind of... I'll probably go further into this at a future date because there's a nice book I read a while back. I didn't read it completely, but it's called Nudge uh, by, I think, Cass Sunstein and somebody else. And Nudge argues for something called liberal paternalism. And most people, when they hear about this, they just, they hate it, right? They don't want any kind of control placed on them. But liberal paternalism kind of is an argument for letting government shape your choice architecture. Okay, so that means, let's say you're um, in a cafeteria and you want people to eat healthy, what you can do is you can put the healthy dishes at the front so that people are more likely to choose these dishes, uh, dishes, right? And in doing this, you haven't really infringed so much on people's freedom, but you've also, you've, I think, I would argue you've actually helped them be more free because you let them live up to their higher rational selves, what they really want, okay? And here's, there's a concept from that book called, I'm just, fuck, I'm just going to so much, going through so much stuff here. There's the hot, cold empathy gap. And what this is, is people don't realize that um, when they're in a situation, in a hot state, let's say you're at a dinner party and somebody puts out a plate of nuts in front of you, okay? In that hot state, you're not going to be living up to your cold state. Let's say before you left your house, you told yourself, I'm not going to eat anything at the party because I'm trying to lose weight. But once you get there, the plate is in front of you, now you want to eat them, okay? And you can't stop. So that's a hot, cold empathy gap where you can't, you kind of face a disconnect. In that cold state, you can't really anticipate just how much you're going to be uh, vulnerable, prone to falling for things that uh, entice you, let's say, right? And here I would argue that to be truly free, you need some help. You need some controls, you need some rules, etc. 
You need to help you need help shaping your choice architecture so that you're more likely to make the choices that are truly good for you. And in that sense, you're free, even if there's a sense of being controlled. Okay. Whereas if you just emph- put all the emphasis emphasis on feeling free, um, on being able to do what you want, then you would reject uh, shaping your choice architecture, and you would just you'd actually be less free because you'd be gorging on that plate of nuts. You'd walk into a grocery uh, shop and uh, yeah, you wouldn't have help in choosing the right items for you. And and smoking is an example. Like smoke to get people to stop smoking, we had to do so much social engineering that helped people. First of all, to realize that smoking is bad for you, we made it harder to get for people. And research shows that when you make something harder to get for people, they actually do it less. Okay, so that's we're shaping the choice architecture to help people there and be even more free. I would argue. Because you're defining freedom as freedom from aversive stimuli, things that are aversive to you, rather than just a feeling of being free, okay, where you now you just reject all controls whatsoever. And I think it's so important for today when we're kind of just running headlong into disaster, okay? I know not everyone shares this opinion, and I think a very good metaphor for this is the juggernaut uh, by Anthony Giddens. I remember reading him in sociology class a long time back when I was studying that. It's this idea that society is just careening out of control. And that's kind of the metaphor that captures what we're going through today. And I think, like Skinner argues actually in a, in a chapter before the freedom chapter, is that we need ways to course correct humanity, okay? We can't just be running headlong into disaster with no way to control ourselves. We need those controls to get the true freedom we value. And I'm going to bring this closer to home with just a personal example, for example. Um, let's say... Let's say I want to be vegan, okay? If I'm just sitting there eating meat like I am doing half the time, I don't consider myself free, even if there's no outside control placed on me, okay? I'm completely free right now, honestly. I can just live completely vegan right now. It would be very easy. It, it's living up to my higher values. But in the moment, there's meat in the fridge. I just end up eating it. I would argue that I'm not free there, despite feeling free, okay? I would actually prefer that I don't have meat in the house, I don't have the freedom to eat it during the day, and that way I'll eat vegan throughout the day just immediately without even trying, okay? So I'm shaping my choice architecture there, and it actually makes me freer to live according to my higher values than if, if I had just focused on the feeling of free and made the choice of meat available to myself in the fridge, right? And I know this is not where Skinner wants to go with this, but I think just entertain that nuance, okay? Think about freedom in this new sense, be extra aware of positive reinforcing enforcers where you're not even aware of how things can be aversive to you in the present because they just feel so good. And just realize that a lot of social controls today are of this kind. Okay. And like, there's a question in democracy. It's like, yes, you feel free, but how free are you really to even wish what you want to wish to desire what you want to desire? Advertising companies spend millions or billions of dollars uh, to make you want something like how free are you even if you feel free if someone is just patterning all your desires okay so just think about freedom in this new light and hopefully in the future i'd like to present more stuff on uh freedom and and even come to a better understanding of this concept myself and also just lastly post in the comments below uh about this concept of freedom what it means to you if you can buy into some of these nuances i present today what might be some problems because of course there's a whole nother side where once you accept the controls, we have a legit fear of the slippery slope leading to a tyranny, governmental oppression, right? So feel free to post something in the comments. Thanks.